Hello, I'm James Townrow. May I tell you a little about the history of Townrow department stores? In uh, the 18th century, uh, in the reigns of the Georges, first, second and third, my ancestors lived in Luton. They were property owners and farmers. Uh, in, the, in 1815, in the year of the Battle of Waterloo, my great-grandfather was born. He was a wealthy man, but sadly, he was wasteful and fast-living. And towards the end of his life, he had very little, and he started up as a baker. In 1845, his son, Charles, my grandfather and the founder of the business was born. He had very little to start with and so he changed his job fairly often. He was a clerk to a furniture maker. He was joined the London police force. He was in the first Royal Dragoons and uh, he was a teacher. Uh, his ambition was to have an income of a hundred pounds a year. He was a kindly man. He loved the peace and solitude of the country. He was not happy in crowds, and nor did he like the sea. His wife bore him 13 children over a span of 21 years. In 1871, my grandfather came to Braintree and he took over a men's clothing business at 65 High Street from a Mr. Cuthbert. He paid the rent of 55 pounds a year to George May, brother of Fred May, a farmer in Stysted. They lived over the shop and with the property went a large garden, the other side of Sandpit Lane, where uh, multi-storey car park, etc., now stand. So it was a large garden and he needed a gardener who required 10p a day. The lighting for the uh, shop and the flat was by naked gas flare and children's bedrooms by candlelight. Uh, my grandfather wore a frock coat and a hard hat in the style that Churchill used to wear. On Sunday mornings, he attended St. Michael's Church with his wife and the family as they came along. And my father, as a young boy, managed to carve his initials CT in the back of one of the pews, which is there today, and I try to sit in that same place. My grandfather, on Sunday afternoons and evenings, used to go for walks on his own. He'd always walk to Gosfield and back, except occasionally when he would have a change and walk to Cressing Temple and back. Brentford Cattle Market was held in the High Street. Uh, try to imagine the scene a hundred so years ago. Um, the, there would be the ponies and traps, horses and carts going to and fro up the street, which would be a, a gravel road, uh, and there would be horses and ponies for sale stood in circles up the street, heads to the center, no halters, cattle just the same, uh, heads to the center, no hurdles, and in between those, there would probably be small animals and birds for sale, such as chickens and ducks and rabbits, and in between them would be itinerant tradesmen who were calling out their wares. There'd be tinkers, there'd be a barrel organ, uh, there would be uh, uh, pots and pans for sale, and so on. And outside where Nat West Bank is today, there was a man dressed as a cowboy who stood on a four-wheeled cart calling out his wares 
trying to sell pills and potions to cure all ailments. In order to attract a, tr a crowd, he would offer to uh, pull, extract teeth free of charge. You can imagine the excitement of watching this terrible ordeal. My father, as a little boy, ran in and out amongst the crowd. He said his tummy ached partly through fear, partly through excitement. When the crowd gathered, the unfortunate victim sitting on the seat on the cart had his teeth, tooth extracted free of charge and also free of anaesthetic. The name of that man was Sequa, and the little children used to sing a ditty. Sequa is coming. Oh dear, oh dear, Sequa is coming. I feel rather queer. In 1894, my grandfather purchased James Fuller's boot shop at number 42 Bank Street, next door to Mr. Bartram's gun shop. <coughs> my grandfather had the whole of the front of the shop painted a brilliant red at a cost of seven pounds, three shillings and fivepence. The windows were lit with three large gas brackets outside the stock was transferred, uh, transferred from the high street in Mr. Choate's pony and cart. And my father had clear visions of uh, a whole load of hard hats, mainly bowlers, all higgledy-piggledy in the cart, wobbling along as they were taken up to the bank street. The shop was opened on the 1st of December, 1894, and the takings came to 13 pounds, seven shillings and ninepence. On Christmas Eve, takings came to six pounds, seven shillings. The turkey to feed the family came to 10 shillings and sixpence, or 52p in today's currency. And the turnover for the year was 1,075 pounds, eight shillings and threepence. In those days, it was uh, a policy to, to give beer to your customers, particularly amongst the grocer's shops. And our company adopted that policy until the beginning of the First World War. The busy days were Saturdays, first and foremost, and Wednesdays. The other days, the other weekdays, were, was, there was very little doing. And my grandfather would travel the local villages, I think hiring Mr. Choate's pony and cart. While he was away, my father and uh, his brother were left in charge. And sadly to say, when there was little doing, they had fun and played pranks. And one of the pranks that they played was to get into an argument or a discussion with a victim as to his height. And to settle the, the, the dispute, he was taken to the little gant at the side of Mr. Bartram's gun shop and stood against the wall to be measured. He didn't realize that the overflow to Mr. Bartram's system was just above his head. And at the appropriate time, a tap on Mr. Bartram's window and his assistant, Mr. Hardy, would arrange for a flow of water to come out of the overflow pipe. Mrs. Wyatt uh, did our alterations, customers' alterations. She lived in New Street and her charge to shorten sleeves or trousers was tuppence. That is to say, a little less than a penny in today's currency. Her husband was deaf and dumb, and she called him dummy. And he did all our footwear repairs. This would be mainly leather soling boots. After working 
18 months, my father was paid 17 and a half P a week, and his younger brother, seven and a half P a week, and the younger one still only two and a half P a week. It doesn't sound a lot today, but of course, they all lived at home. A bottle of gin then cost 12 and a half P, and for one P, you could buy 10 cigarettes or a pint of best beer. An income tax was fortunes in the pound. <coughs> we were then selling laborers' jackets with cord fronts and moleskin sleeves and six pearl buttons. At that time, in 1896, we had a brochure of the, showing a great variety of clothing that was being sold. In there was uh, an Eton suit, exactly as I wore at school on Sundays 70 years ago. Home uh, now for my grandparents was on the corner of uh, Market, Great Square and Market Square, where Bradley Bingley Taylor's estate agents now are. My grandfather paid 500 pounds for it, and he had to borrow some of the money, and he got, borrowed it from a Mr. Hodges, who was a butcher in Railway Street, predecessor to Mr. Mayo, who was father of Dr. Mayo. In 1898, my grandparents decided they'd have a week's holiday in Clapton. Uh, they took one or two of the children with them, but in three days they were back again. My father, grandfather couldn't stick anymore. The total cost was three pounds, 10 shillings. On Christmas Eve in 1897, the stores closed at 11 o'clock at night. My father then walked the two and a half miles back to his lodging, having already walked that distance at the beginning of the day. He washed and changed, and then carrying a portmanteau with presents for the family, he walked the three miles to Liverpool Street Station. The next train from Braintree left at 8.30 on Christmas Day, and so he spent the night on the platform with several other men, all wearing their silk hats, and one of them was Mr. Eustace Jocelyn, a member of the well-known family of estate agents and furnishers in Braintree. In 1901, we took on our first assistant, his name was Mr. Peck. Until then, with six sons in the family, there was no need to have anybody else. <clears throat> Mr. Herbert Peck was with us for 30 years. In 1902, on the 17th of February, my grandfather died of pneumonia at the age of 58. My father then had to return home to run the Braintree shop in order to keep his mother and 10 brothers and sisters and himself no mean task for a young man of 23. And so he had to work very hard and he denied himself much. He, he in the weekdays, he traveled the villages riding a bicycle with samples in those, a hundred years ago, bicycles were heavy, cumbersome things with solid tires. Uh, roads were gravel and potholed. And you can imagine how tiring, tired he must have been by the time he returned home. In 1919, we moved to larger premises, to number 5153 High Street previously occupied by Henry Pryke and Sons, high-class retailers and tailors. Five years later, we were the first to build a large arcade 
in that shop. The windows were filled from top to ceiling with stock and customers would choose their purchases from the windows. Until we installed central heating in 1929, the shop was heated by paraffin oil stoves, which were lit on arrival each morning. So in winter, the first hour or two would be cold. Male assistants then wore long, un long underpants, long sleeves, thick vests, cardigans over waistcoats, and of course they all wore black jackets, striped trousers, and, and stiff collar. The staff worked a 51-hour week and received two weeks paid holiday. Most men wore suits in those days, particularly for Sunday best. And if there was a loss in the family, men would often wear black suits, and these were made specially for them to measure in a 24-hour service. Home deliveries became a very essential service. Most people w wouldn't carry their purchases, even a shirt or three pairs of socks. And so errand boys were in great demand. Eventually, we replaced our errand boy with a porter, Freddie Buttle. And Freddie was dressed in a smart brown uniform with peak cap, and he dr drove our delivery van. My records show that on the 5th of May, 1937, we delivered 150 parcels round Braintree. Our own stock was delivered to us uh, by goods train and were brought up to us from Braintree goods station by Frankie Rudkin in his little open top van. The third generation of, of the Town Row family uh, consisted of my brother Peter and myself. We both joined in the 1930s. I joined in 1935 and 65 years on and still working if only mornings. My brother Peter introduced the ladies' fashions and in 1935 he held a fashion show in the Institute. It was then called a mannequin parade. In the same year, we were the first firm to have a coloured advertisement in the Braintree Whitham Times. This was coloured green. We were then selling men's shirts between seven and sixpence and 13 shillings, and raincoats from 30 shillings to two guineas. We were still selling some industrial clothing, and on one occasion, Clearwater Manufacturing Company asked us to quote for a large number of boiler suits. We found the best price for our, from our suppliers and for our profit, we added a farthing, which in today's currency would be less than one eighth of a penny. But we still failed to get the order and perhaps it was just as well because had they purchased 500 boiler suits, we should have made a profit of 52p, and out of that, we would have to receive the goods in, check them off, pack them up, deliver them, and also stand by any complaints. The Second World War, 1939 to 1945, brought with it the need for blackout curtains, ration cards, clothing coupons, utility clothing, and shortages. And its shortages existed for two or three years after the war had ended. Sales were only held in January, and they lasted for a maximum of two weeks, but invariably for four or five days. And in one year, only one day, our customers invariably queued up at the, on the first day of sale, and on the 3rd of January, 1951, our queue extended from 51 High Street up the street, round the corner, and about 20 yards up the Bank Street. 
at that time, arcades were a great asset to selling. And we rebuilt our arcade in 1953 in time for the coronation of our queen, Elizabeth II. And we rebuilt the arcade again in 1970. In 1954, we bought our second shop in the High Street, numbers 76 to 78, from a Mr. Trevor Blake. But previously, for many, many years, it had been owned by Miss Jocelyn, and she'd uh, used it as a stationer's printing shop and a, a toy sales. <coughs> Mr. Blake, uh, I knew to be a hard bargainer because I'd already sold him my house, and the negotiations were tough, and after three visits to his home, my old home, we came to a successful agreement. We rebuilt the property and enlarged it into a, a large ladies' fashion store, and right from the outset, it was a resounding success, and the success continued uh, even after my brother Peter, who managed it, retired and my son Richard took over. In 1974, as far as we were concerned, self-selection had arrived. The counter barrier between staff and customers had been cleared away. This had been coming gradually, but it had arrived in full now. May I now remind you about the Arab oil embargo, which took place in 1973 and caused co commerce and industry enormous trouble for eight or nine years, not only in Great Britain, but throughout the world. In 1974, the cost of petrol rose from 42 pence a gallon to 72 pence a gallon, an increase of 75%. Inflation and recession, barrel of oil quadrupled, wool and cotton costs doubled, and prices rose by 20%. There was terrible liquidity problems, and it all resulted in unemployment of three, over three million. In 83, Courtauld's both closed both their factories. Nathan Elliott suffered a terrible loss in the first half of the year, and Crittles suffered terribly too. In 1982, the year of the Falklands War, my son Richard James, the fourth generation of Townrow, became managing director. He joined us in 1966. This heralded a time of rapid expansion and growth and the adoption of modern technology. We joined a large buying group called the Association Asian Independent Stores, which covered 270 stores with a combined turnover of over a billion pounds. This gave us and our customers the advantage of mass buying power. In the three years between 1985 and 1988, <coughs> we purchased a store in Frinton on Sea 84 High Street, Braintree, for our pension fund, and the old Central Cinema in the High Street, which was from Tesco, which was their first store when they came to Braintree. By 1994, we'd acquired the shops either side of the Tesco property, and we'd installed all departments into our 10,000 square feet store which now exists. Our managing director, Richard, achieved all this in spite of another 
terrible slump which existed from 1988 to 1993 and caused a further unemployment figure of over three million. The Lloyds crash and at one stage 53 business crashing daily. His strong leadership, determination, courage and terribly hard work and good judgment enabled us to achieve all this. We're now back where we started 130 years ago, 50 times larger, employing over 70 staff. And we look to the 21st century with enthusiasm. Giving reasonable conditions, Braintree has a fine prospect.